Good morning and welcome everyone. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist at EarningsBeats.com, and this is Trading Places Live. Before we get started today uh, with a special Trading Places show, I'd like to uh, wish everyone a very happy holiday season and a wonderful new year ahead. Uh, please stay safe throughout the season. All right, uh, today is going to be a special show. I want to go over just a few uh, things that really, um, if you're new to listening to my shows or reading my blogs or whatever, um, if you're just new to, to, to how I approach the market, I want to go through a few things that I think will help you not only understand my approach, but also I think could help in yours. So what I thought I would do is go through a few things that I, that I thought would be important to, uh, to try to share with you in about 30 minutes or so. The first thing I want to do is talk a little bit about style buttons and how important they are at stock charts. I mean, if you've got your own account and you're, uh, you know, you're thinking about how to set it up, I want to show you how important setting these style buttons can be and how quickly it will help you uh, organize and look at your different charts and so forth under different time frames or different, different ways of looking at the charts. Uh, then I'll get into trend trading. That's basically what I do. I trend trade. And so I want to go through some of the indicators that I use and just quickly explain uh, why I use them and how I use them. Then we'll get into candlesticks. I'm not going to go into a long dissertation about candlesticks. That could be a couple hours in itself. Uh, but I want to just go through and explain a couple, the basics of candlesticks, and then maybe a couple that I think uh, are very useful, at least in my trading. And then I'm going to wrap up with really the heart of my trading, which is gap trading. Uh, I do a lot of trading around earnings season with the gaps that are created from earnings, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So let's go ahead and jump in first to style buttons. And I'm going to show you, first of all, this is just a chart of Apple, and it's just a uh, daily chart for the last year. Now, let's say that you would like to save a chart style, and let's go into, I don't know, let's say you want to have a weekly 20-year uh, chart. Um, and I don't know, let's say um, you also want to put in here the uh, simple moving average for the 200 day. Um, now I usually have blue for simple and let's use uh, red for the 200 day moving average. Uh, let's just go with that. Let's just say that this is the way you want to have a chart. This is one of the chart styles you want to set up. Now, I've just done the chart, but if I go to uh, my default chart and then go to another stock and I want to set this chart up again, I have to go back down here and I have to re-enter all this, which takes time. I mean, you just saw what I had to do just to, to create this one chart. Well, stock charts makes it really easy for you because they've got this little plus button right here. So if you click on this plus button, you can then type in whatever you want to call this thing. I'll just say 20 year weekly chart and I can add new. Now, when you first look up here on your buttons, it's not here. So what you do is you go and hit this little carrot at the top uh, or a greater sign. And then you come down here and you see it's down here below. Here's your buttons. These are all the buttons that show up down here doesn't show up. So what I can do is I can go grab this chart and just drag it up. And now it's above the line. So when I get rid of it, now all of a sudden I can go over here and look at uh, my 10 minute five day chart. And now down here at the bottom, see it? 20 year weekly chart is showing up. Now I just click on a button and there's the chart I just saved, the chart style. So these buttons are really cool. Now I scrambled the order here. Let me see if I can uh, reorder these. Usually what I do is I like to start with the shortest term first. So 10 minute five day chart would be first. Then I would get into my hourly. So I, I'll move that up there to hourly. Then I have my daily. Uh, then I have my weekly three year. That's, this is what I normally do. And then I have my monthly 15 year. And then I have my relative chart. And I would take these other two out and I, because they normally are not what I would be looking at. So when I do that and now I go back now I've got all of them set up. So there's my 10 minute, hourly, daily, weekly, monthly, and relative. This is the one that if you've been following me, you know I've, I use quite a bit. This just tells me the stock, the industry group, 
the stock versus the industry group, so relative strength among its peers, relative strength among the S or versus the S&P 500, and then its peers versus the S&P 500. So that's how I get my chart styles. That's how I have mine set up. Uh, but you could literally, by adding the different charts that you like, add them, and then as soon as you add them, go in here and just drag them up, and then they become your buttons, and then you can order them however you like. So I think that's a pretty cool way to be able to evaluate your stocks in different time frames and to do it very, very quickly. So can you imagine if I had Apple when I was at a 10 minute chart and then I wanted to look at the hourly chart? Okay, now I gotta go down here. I've gotta change my period to hour. Uh, let's see, I had it on a month. So now I gotta change it to a month. Um, and I don't remember all of the different settings, whether I had these settings different or not, but every time I wanted to change the, the time frame, I would have to go down to the bottom and do that. I don't have to do that anymore. Now, if I want hourly, I just simply click a button. So it's really a great way to organize your charts and your chart styles so that you can quickly look at a stock in multiple time frames and different ways. Again, it doesn't have to just be based on time frames. You could have a style button that maybe looks at different indicators. You know, you might have a style button that's called, I don't know, Bollinger. And so you wanted to look at the Bollinger band. Well, here's uh, let's see, we changed the Bollinger band, put that um, on your chart up here, and maybe that's something you want. Um, now that's a new style. Um, so you could go in here again, click your plus button and, and set it up. So anyway, I that's just a real quick little tutorial on making sure you get your style buttons set up properly. Next up, I wanna go into trend trading. And trend trading for me involves a few different things. Now. I used to be a big fan of the MACD, moving average, convergence, divergence, and I switched to the PPO. The reason I switched is really the two are basically the same. And what I've done here, just to give you a, a quick sample of what these are, is I've, I've plotted on this chart the uh, 1226.9 uh, PPO, same thing for the MACD, and then on, on the overlays, I've changed my overlays to the exponential moving averages, the 12 and 26 day. And the reason I did this is so you can see how this 12, 26, 9 of the PPO and MACD are calculated. So up here, here is Netflix. And this is as of a year and a half ago. This isn't current chart. This is, goes back a ways. Um, but here's the 12 and 26 period, in this case, a daily uh, PPO, or excuse me, 12 and 26 day e EMA. And the difference of these two is your MACD. So if you simply set up a chart, any chart, and set it up to the 12 period EMA and the 26 period EMA, and you look at the difference, you should, and you also have a MACD on your screen, they should be the same. So right here, 233.80 minus 218.42 is 1538. That's your difference in the two moving average in terms of dollars. That's the, that's the distinction here. The MACD, you're looking at dollars, 1538. You pull up the MACD and there it is, 1538. If you look over to the right on the scale, you'll see it's right there at 1538. All right, that's the MACD. The PPO takes that 1538 and divides it into that 26 period moving average. So you come up with a percentage. So your 12, in this case, your 12 day EMA is 7.04% higher than your 26 day EMA. And if you look at the PPO, there it is on the scale, 704, and there's your calculation, 7.042. So it's really simple, and laying it out on a chart, I think maybe helps you to understand it a little bit better. But you might say, well, what's the difference? Why would I care? Why not you? I mean, if they're basically the same thing, one's dollar, one's percentage, what's the difference? Why choose one over the other? Well, I finally switched to the PPO because there are a couple benefits. Number one, if you have a stock like Amazon that years ago was down at you know, $100 or $50, and now it's at $1,700, it's really hard to compare MACDs from now to 20 years ago because the prices were so much different. Same thing when you're looking at a, 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 the MACD of an Amazon and you're comparing it to the MACD of say, Sirius Holdings. Um, 
you know, you've got a $7 stock versus a $1,700 stock. If you're looking at the dollar difference between the moving averages, that can be very misleading. You can't compare the securities or you can't compare the Netflix or uh, Amazon versus where it was 20 years ago. With the PPO, you can. The PPO is a percentage. So you can kind of get an idea of on a percentage basis, when does Netflix get overbought? You can't do it on a dollar basis because, again, the dollar difference now will be completely different than what it was 20 years ago. The percentage, though, should be fairly similar. So that's one way. Now I'm going to just show you um, – uh, well, I think this pretty much explains it. I don't think I need to go into the detail of showing individual charts, but Amazon and, and Sirius are going to obviously show you different charts based on this. So just understand that the MACD is the dollar difference and the PPO is the percentage difference. All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about the PPO and how I use that. When the PPO is rising, what I normally look for, and a PPO moving higher is generally just telling you that either the downward momentum is slowing and you're starting to turn up, or you're actually in an uptrend. And when the PPO rolls over and starts moving down, it means that your upward momentum is slowing. And if you cross that zero line, it's really telling you that you've got downward momentum. Well, when you've got a trend in place, I like moving averages. Now, when you're trendless and you're going nowhere, like uh, right in here, not really doing a whole lot, moving averages don't be, aren't, aren't nearly as effective. But when you're in an uptrend like we are here, what I like to do is use that 20-day moving average as support. So I move up, the PPO is moving up, and when I pull back, I look for a 20-day test. If, it, if it's successful and it continues to bounce, it's telling me I'm trending, you know, I'm trending higher. If it doesn't bounce, and goes back below, I'm either in a trendless market or that uptrend is reversing and I'm beginning a downtrend. So it's really the combination of the two. I like to try to use the PPO with my moving average. Um, oh, I do have a couple of examples. So I'll go ahead and go through these. Here's the uh, high dollar um, versus a low dollar stock. So here's Amazon. Look at the PPO. PPO tops out around 2%. The bottom, you know, we're downtrending, it bottoms about 2% over the course of the last year or so. The MACD, however, you can see goes up as high as 40 and goes down as low as minus 40 for the most part. Now let's look. This is a, a different small stock, Office Depot. So I didn't put the arrows on here, but you can see Office Depot, even though the MACD only went to 20 cents, nowhere near that $40 that was on the, Mac, that was on the uh, uh, Amazon chart, that 20 cents is much bigger in terms of a percentage of its stock price. You can see we get up close to 10%. $0.20 cents versus $2.60 is almost 10%. So this versus the Amazon uh, example where it's only 2% uh, is a little, um, you know, a little different. Okay, so here, let's go ahead and move on to the EMA tests. So I talked a little bit about the moving averages. Let's look at this uh, a year-long chart on Apple. And I think you can quickly look and see that while it's trending higher, when it pulls back, this green moving average is the 20-day moving average. And I can see that pulling back and holding uh, before uh, moving up to new highs. So one of my trading strategies is simply to buy on a 20-day test in an uptrending st stock. And that's what I say a lot when you hear me talking about it on Trading Places Live or when I'm pointing things out in my blog. I'll say, you know, wait until we get a pullback to maybe the 20-day. This is what I'm referring to. And you can see as a short-term trader, you know, this, this can be a really good strategy. Now, you might say, well, why not just buy and just hold it? Because you would have had all this gain instead, of, and you wouldn't have taxes and, uh, well, before commissions, but we don't have to worry about commissions anymore. Um, I would simply say this. Not every stock is Apple. Not every stock just goes up and up and up and pulls back for a little bit and then continues going higher again. Apple has a history of doing that. Most stocks don't. So you really want to watch these moving averages because when they roll over and they're trading below the 20-day, you really don't want to hold it. All right. Um, let's move on to the RSI. On all my charts, you'll see the RSI at the bottom. I don't talk about the RSI a lot, but I actually use it quite a bit to run my scans. 
Um, the RSI, you can see in an uptrending stock here from the time we bottom and start this uptrend, I draw, drew this line right around RSI 40 um, because normally in an uptrend, RSI 40 becomes oversold. And a lot of times you'll go above 70, maybe even getting up to 80. So the, the range on the RSI in an uptrend is different than the range on the RSI in the sideways market or in a downtrending market. So you want to keep that in mind. So anytime I see the RSI dipping down into the 40s, I think that's potentially an opportunity to get in. Now I'm going to look at the chart. I'm not going to buy a stock just because the RSI says it's 40 or just because the RSI gets down to 49. But when I do get a stock with an RSI down in the 40s and it's an uptrending stock, I really begin to look at it as a possible trade candidate. So I'm going to be looking at other things that come into play. So when a stock, for instance, comes down like this, um, I could add another line here and show you. But, you know, we kind of broke out. We were downtrending, moved up, moved up here, kind of broke out, got up to, what, 21 and some change, went sideways, and then broke out again. When we came back down here and we hit RSI 40, we printed a hammer. Now, I'm going to talk about candlesticks in just a minute. But this move down, putting a hammer in, that is normally a reversing candle off of a trend, off of a downtrend. So, and you can see the hammer absolutely stopped this movement to the downside moved up. So if I see an RSI 40 and I run a scan and this chart comes up and I see a hammer printing, this becomes a viable trading candidate. All right. Let's go on to, let's move on to candlesticks. So for candlesticks, I'm just going to start with a basic candlestick. I don't, I couldn't trade without candlesticks. I have a lot of people I respect a lot, a lot of fellows, our fellow colleagues here at um, stock charts that use bar charts and so forth. I just can't do it. Um, I see so much visually from, from candlesticks and I've been doing this for many, many, many years. So it's very quick for me just to spot things based on looking at candlesticks that I just can't see quickly when I'm looking at a bar chart um, or a line chart. Line chart shows me nothing really. Uh, but looking at the basic candlesticks, these are the, the concepts that you really need to know. The black filled candle right here, the red filled candle right here, the hollow black candle over here, and then the red hollow candle right here. That's, I mean, if you can figure out those four things and keep those straight in your mind, you can begin to really figure out what's going on. Let me just tell you that filled candles in general are bearish. Any filled candle is uh, you have the close below the open. So there are four parts of the candlestick. You can see these tails to the top and bottom. That's the high of the day, the low of the day. The filled candle body is simply filling in from the open to the close. So the top and the bottom of the rectangle will be the open and the close. And the color and whether it's filled is well the fill whether it's filled is telling you which one's the open and which one's the, the close. A filled candle is bearish, so you're always thinking close at the bottom, open at the top. Opened up here, we finished the day down here. Same with the red. Opened up here, we finished down here. Now you might say, well, what's the difference between black and red? Well, the black actually finishes up for the day. We had gapped up, went down, closed lower, but we still were up for the day. Here, we actually gapped down finish lower, and we were down for the day. When you have a filled candle and you're down for the day, it's red. When you have a filled candle and you're up for the day, it's black. Black is a little bit more bullish. Red is a little bit more bearish when you're looking at candlesticks. Now, a filled black candle like this off of an uptrend, I won't get into it. It's kind of like a reversing candle, like the hammer off of a downtrend. Black candle off of an uptrend is generally a sign that you've probably reached a short-term top. And it, of course, that worked here. Now, when you get to the hollow candles, here you've got a hollow candle that's black outlined. Here you have a hollow candle, and it's red outlined. And it's the same type of thought process as the black and red filled candles. It's just that it's in reverse. So a black um, outlined hollow candle means that you finished higher for the day, and you also finished above the open. So you gap down, 
you opened, you came up here and you closed and you finished in positive territory. So that is a black outlined uh, hollow candle. Over here, the red one, you gap down, you closed above your open, but you were still down for the day. All right. So you can come back and look at this later on the, on the recording, but I just wanted to point out how you can uh, hopefully start to grasp some of the basics of candlesticks if you're not already um, aware of how they work. Now, I'm just going to go over three bullish candlesticks, and I'm going to go over bullish because we're in a bull market. I think we're going to continue to be in a bull market. And so off of downtrends, I look for these types of candles. Here on Murata, and this is back in 2018, I well, didn't really care about the timing. Uh, but here off of this downtrend, that is a bullish engulfing candle. You gap down and then you come up and you completely engulf that prior candle off of a downtrend. It also happened to be at a pretty key support level or close to it. And that reverses the fortune of the chart. And you can see after trending lower, we reverse with that bullish engulfing candle and now we move higher. Piercing candle. A piercing candle is a wannabe uh, bullish engulfing candle. It just doesn't quite make it. So now this one is kind of close. It looks like it opens about the same um, level. But what you want to see is off of a downtrend with a bullish engulfing candle, you gap down and then you come up and you completely engulf. You close above that prior candle. A piercing candle comes up and closes in the top half of that prior candle. So it's a wannabe bullish engulfing candle. It doesn't quite make it. But when it happens off of a downtrend and it happens at a key area, in this case, gap support, that's when it starts to you know, make uh, some more sense to me in terms of maybe being something I'd be interested in. And you can see it bounces. Now, you know these candlesticks, a lot of times when you see a reversal, it could just be for a day or two. These don't tell us that we're going to start a massive bull market run to the upside. You need other indicators um, you know, your relative strength, what the overall market's doing, what the industry group's doing. You need to know a lot of different things before making a call like that. But if you happen to like the stock a lot and you like the industry group and you do think that this could be a major bottom, you could use this as a reason to, to buy and to hold for a while. In this case, we go up to the 20, we come right back down, we hold support, and then we start moving back up again. Go all the way back up to test this resistance, and then we come back down. But that is what started it, that... Uh, piercing candle. And then the hammer is the final one. And I did give you some rules here because the hammer, there are lots. I use the hammer more than any of the others, mostly because the hammer normally finishes closer to support. The bullish engulfing candle, when you see that, you've already had a big reversal. The hammer, a lot of times, you get a, you'll get a tail that goes below support and then come back up and close just above it. You can get it very close to a support level. So what I look for with the hammer is follow a downtrend. You want to see it coming in after a downtrend. You would like to see it uh, finish with the candle body in the upper one third of the candlestick, which this one does. A long tail to the downside, longer, better, especially if it goes down below support and then comes back up and holds it. That's when I find it to be very bullish. The higher the volume, the better. Got an uptick in volume here. It wasn't a light volume day. And then look for corroborating technical signals. In this case, gap support and price support. There's your gap support. Here was the low to test that support. So if you get in here, the key in trading is that you can keep a tight stop. You don't have to worry about things going too far to the downside. Um, and you're looking for an immediate uh, move back to the upside. So if you go down through about $34, you can probably keep about a 2 3% stop. But in this case, by getting in, you go through the 20, you hold the 20, you get up, you hold the 20, hold the 20, you get all the way up to 46. And then up here, we, this would be another, uh, another uh, um, uh, area that we could cover for a different day. But here you've got higher prices, you've got a negative divergence. And on this move to the upside, volume was much lighter than on the breakout. So you had a negative divergence. There were other reasons to sell, including that bearish engulfing candle right there at the top. But... That's just how I look at these candlesticks and how I use it in my trading. All right, let's move into our final segment today. And I want to go over gap trading because this is a big part of what I do. Now, I keep a strong earnings chart list where stocks have beaten top and bottom line. And I'm looking for stocks that also are uh, trading, uh, in, in my opinion, bullishly. Either they're in an uptrend or maybe they've been in a downtrend and they're starting to reverse. 
uh, anything that suggested maybe we've got an uptrend going. So in this case, with the gaps, now you get gaps all over the place in the stock market. Every day, just about, there's a gap. Rarely do stocks open exactly where they traded the, the day before. But some gaps are different than other gaps. And I think you can kind of look at this chart and you can see that gap's a little different than anything else. This gap right here is a little different than anything else. This one over here, not quite as much, but still a pretty good gap. And then this final one over here, look at the volume on these four. They were all earnings related. Every one of them earnings related. Now, what I tend to look for when you get these big gap ups with earnings is a couple of different things. I actually didn't mark, I could mark another uh, line here on this chart as well, because really there are three that I tend to look at. There, there would be the other one. So using our candlestick knowledge that we just gained, you can see that uh, Target had closed before earnings around $111. And with its earnings, here is, this is a hollow candle. So you're opening at the lower end of the, of the candle and you're closing at the top end of this candle body. So you're opening at 122.50. So picture this in your head. 111 was the prior close. They come out with blowout earnings. The stock opens at 122. It's up $11 at the open. Intraday, it gets down as low as 118. And then the buyers come back in. That 118 is a support level now because sellers were completely in control. And if you know much about gaps, you know a lot of gaps will fill, meaning that you'll go all the way back down to the close from the prior day. When on this kind of volume, you go down and you set that low at 118 and then come back up and finish above the open, that level becomes very important from a technical perspective. So I've now looked at three different areas here, top of gap support, bottom of gap support, and the low, the intraday low, the day after earnings. Those are three really key levels that you will see me highlight on my strong earnings chart list stocks very often. Now, when Target moves up here to 128, 129, whatever, when it pulls back, it goes back to where? That first key support level. 122 and a half, it gets there and it bounces right off of it and right back up to 129. So if I was somebody thinking about accumulating a position, one of the first levels that I would look for would be this 122 and a half area. That's where market makers looked at all of the, that's their role, it's one of their roles is you know, with earnings or new news coming out, they look at all the demand, the supply, and they try to price a stock where they believe is a fair price based on the demand and supply. So sometimes you'll see them gap up and you'll see them come all the way back down to fill the gap. Sometimes you'll see them gap up and just keep going higher. The ones that gap up and keep going higher are, in my opinion, the ones that show tremendous demand. So we wanna keep that in mind as we go forward and looking back. Now look at this one, this one gapped up and never even came back to the top of its gap support before it kept moving up. That tells me there's a lot of demand for the stock because anytime you get a lot of buying coming in, heavy volume, market makers are on the other side of that trade. And when they're on the other side of the trade, normally a stock is going to pull back. That is why most gaps will fill. The ones that don't, I think you need to pay particular attention to because they are in essence beating you over the head that you've got a lot of demand in the stock. Market makers cannot hold back all of the buyers, and that can be a very, very bullish development. As you can see, gap up here, we keep moving up, we pull back, gap up, we continue moving up, gap up, and it's just been one continuation gap after another. Okay, that is what I wanted to go over today. So that'll just give you a little bit more background into how I do things. So make sure you set those style buttons. Look for the things I talked about, trend trading. Use the candlesticks, get used to them, and then the gap trades. And I think uh, it'll help your trading as we go forward in 2019 and into 2020. Thanks so much, everybody. Happy trading. Mm -hmm.